So as I mentioned, I just got back from Seattle. It took me three days to drive up there to visit my twin sister, who I love so very much. We're very close. In the first few days when I got there, it was really great. We were just catting up, you know, chatting away and everything. And then her son, my nephew, who's 11 years old, he came to his mom and he said, uh, I want this new game. Can I get this new game? It's called Pokemon Go. <laughs> So my sister read up on it and decided to try it out for herself. And what was interesting was that she got kind of obsessed about it, about collecting all of the Pokemon, right? And I kind of, you know, I went along with her for a little while. It was kind of, it was kind of fun, you know, you're, sitting, you're walking around with your phone going like this the entire time as you're trying to catch them. But she would get up really early to walk to beat the crowds and she was excited about catching all of her Pokemon. Like I said, first I went along with her. Um, but you really can't have a conversation with someone when they're looking at their phone <laughs> like this all the time. And so eventually, I, you know, after a little bit, I got a little upset with her. And I sat her down and I said, Rick, I came all the way up here to see you. You know, can you please, you know, just in moderation, please. And, uh, and, she, and she, she totally agreed. But it really got me thinking about this, this idea of pleasure without conscience, that we kind of want to indulge in that immediate hit, you know. And if, by the way, you're playing Pokemon Go right now, that's okay. Um, I just expect you to keep it away if you're going to get an Eevee or a Pidgey because they're really common. But if you get something rare, just tell me afterwards, okay? <laughs> that's fine. But, you know, in our society, it does say, you know, indulge, right? Have fun. You know, one more bite won't hurt you. Boy, I listened to that one, didn't I? <laughs> you know, it says go fast, zoom, feel the thrill. And in fact, to be considered sort of successful in the society, it pushes you to a lifestyle that's filled with mansions or fast cars and lots of sex, which may or may not be with the person that you're committed to. But that's what our society tells you what success is. And there's also been sort of a little bit of this pushback on judging that to say, well, how come I should be able to enjoy a pleasurable activity? Why not indulge yourself? Oh, don't be so uptight. So when does indulging yourself become irresponsible? I think most of us know what our lines are. When does it become unconscionable, that is, without conscience? And of course, then, when is it OK? Well, Gandhi's grandson said that his grandfather thought pleasure should come from a spiritual place. That's what he said in the opening <laughs> words, right? Should be a spiritual kind of pleasure that is helping others, building relationships, all that sort of thing. It's all about connecting with people. So does that mean we should sort of forego all of the physical pleasures unless it's spiritual? I don't want to give up my chocolate. <laughs> we need to be careful about all of that. I mean, I, Gandhi was a very unique being. Because the last thing we want to do as Unitarian Universalists is to say that physical pleasures are bad, right? That the sins of the flesh, of the flesh, excuse me, or that is pleasure, that's a theology that doesn't jive well with us. It smacks of blaming Eve in the Garden of Eden, of sort of that Augustinian morality which says this world is fallen and sinful. Pleasure in and of itself is not bad or sinful. It's a physical sensation that feels good and everyone in the world experiences it. It's part of life. But when we obsess over it without conscience, without a sense of responsibility, that's when we kind of get into trouble. My sister in Pokemon Go is just a very small example, although there are some larger ones of people, literally I was driving, when I was driving back here, there was someone in their car on the freeway, everybody's going 65, and he was going about 35, and I could tell he was looking down at his phone because he's trying to catch a Pokemon along the side of the freeway. That's when it starts getting a bit much. Yeah. You know, and everyone does experience pleasure and even indulgence, and even Gandhi did. And this is how I know. I remember hearing this story a long time ago. It's about a woman who wants to stop her son from eating sugar. I guess he's indulging a lot in eating sweets and sugars. So she drags him all the way up into northern uh, India, into his ashram, and puts him before Gandhi and says, please tell my son to stop eating sweets. And Gandhi says, OK, come back in a couple of weeks. Fine, OK. So she goes away, and she comes back in a couple of weeks. And, and uh, 
puts her son before him and says, please tell him to stop eating sweets. So Gandhi turns to the son and says, stop eating sweets. And the mother's like, well, why did she just say that two weeks ago? And he said, well, because two weeks ago I was eating sweets. <laughs> now, I remember when I heard the story, I knew that it was, it was about personal integrity, right? Maybe good parenting, you know, modeling what, you, what you're doing. But it always struck me was that Gandhi, who's known for his, right, his sort of uh, ascetism, right, the absence of worldly pleasure, that he ate sweets on occasion. That always made me feel better. <laughs> I like to think of, of pleasure as not bad in and of itself. It's when we go overboard that it becomes harmful. There are all different types of pleasure, certainly physical, mental, and spiritual. But uh, Arun Gandhi, when he was expounding on the words of his, of his grandfather's work, he puts pleasure into these kind of these two extremes, right? Pleasure without conscience, which is what he thinks of as physical pleasure, which is bad, and then spiritual pleasure, and that's good. And that kind of extreme kind of got me going, I just don't think that that's a good way to look at it. I'm not sure that that stark distinction is really helpful, because I think that pleasure, it really it exists really on kind of a, a continuum. And so I created what I thought as shallow pleasure, that is something without conscience, and then something called deep pleasure, which is something where you're going deeper into something. And all things of pleasure exist upon this. Even spiritual, okay, I think exists upon this continuum. Because you can have the spiritual pleasure of self-righteousness, right? <laughs> that to me is sort of somewhat shallow, right? Because it's all about me. Because what do we mean by shallow pleasure? When you're in the area of a pleasure that's uh, kind of more of a sh on the shallow end, I think that there are certain characteristics that make something more of a shallow uh, pleasure. So chances are... First of all, it's momentary. It's very quick. The physical player response, but you kind of keep wanting more of it, right? Like that first bite into a Snickers, right? Oh, that tastes really good. <laughs> then by the end of it, you're like, this is really kind of really overly sugary. <laughs> it doesn't have the same effect than when you first bought into it. But then you start, you know that's on the shallow end when you start needing it or craving it. Now, every time I go to the grocery store, I'm gonna pick up that Snickers. Addictions can be this way. They can be sort of unconscious as a habit or a Pavlovian kind of response. Mm -hmm. Then sometimes what happens is you start resenting it. Starts costing too much money, too much of your time, but you still don't stop. You still keep going. And it may hurt others. It may hurt your job, your loved ones. It may hurt yourself. Because ultimately, Shallow pleasure is, it's all about me, right? And it's something often that you would do alone. You could do it with others, but you often do it alone, oftentimes even secretly. Now, <clears throat> if you're thinking that this sounds like addictions, you know, you're, you're right, that's one form of pleasure without conscience. As someone who has a food addiction or has lived with it for a long time, I know how that goes. But even something as simple as buying a really expensive car that you really can't afford, right? You get that high from getting it, showing it off to people. But it's momentary because then you're stressed because how in the world am I going to be able to afford this thing? And you worry about whether it's going to get scratched or in that accident. That's when the dread starts setting in. We think that addictions are something like drugs and alcohol or food or sex, but addictions also exist on a continuum. In fact, interesting thing about addictions, I took a class on, on addictions, and actually, it's actually not considered um, an official mental illness. You should know this about addictions. There's something called the DSM out there that any psychologist <laughs> or therapist uses that categorizes people into various things so that on insurance they can say, yes, this person belongs to this type of thing. Addiction actually is not in there because they haven't been able to figure out exactly what it is. They do know about abuse, so drug abuse or alcohol abuse, that kind of thing but not necessarily an addiction. Because it's really hard to define. And people have been struggling with this, defining what an addiction is. But I think the one definition that I read was, was pretty good. It says you sometimes do it more than you would like to do it. Okay? And you continue to do it despite negative consequences. So you do it more than you would like to do it, 
and you continue to do it despite negative consequences. Now you might think easily of drugs or sex or food, but it can go with con controlling thought patterns, for example. Say you're kind of a controlling person, and you know that it's wrong. You know that it upsets people or people get kind of twitchy about it, but you still do it. There's so much opportunity to indulge in pleasures in our country. And uh, not only do we have sort of this freedom of thought, but freedom to buy just about anything you could possibly want. And there's both challenge and gift of living in this sort of capitalistic and democratic society. And part of it is learning to live with how do you deal with all these pleasures right at your fingertips. Let's look, though, at deep pleasure. Then what is deep pleasure? So here's our pleasure continually again. And a deep pleasure says, OK, first of all, it tends to last a long time. It sits with you for a long time and gives you pleasure for a really long time. You rarely forget it. So for example, I remember when I was about 16 or 17, my older sister, I visited her in San Francisco, and she took me out to my very first really fancy restaurant where they had really good, healthy food, because it was San Francisco Bay Area, and this would have been the 1980s. And I remember thinking, I'm going to try something unique. I didn't even know what, like, the menu, I didn't even know what to read on it. So I chose a word that I knew, which was shark. <laughs> so I thought, I wonder what shark tastes like. So I tried this, and it was the most amazing meal I had ever had to that date. And it was pleasurable. And it was partly great because I was sitting there with my sister and having this new experience as a 16, 17 year old being in this fancy restaurant. And I remember that and it stays with me, that pleasure of that meal. It could be even a profound sexual experience that you had with a loved one, right? That time when the intimacy and vulnerability just opens everyone up and it's absolutely amazing. So it doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, you're in meditation and have that experience. The second is that it's community oriented and it's selfless. It's not just about you. The second is that it helps and doesn't harm the world, including yourself. So in other words, all of this means that it has meaning to you. Because that's what really spirituality is, right? It's about meaning building. So the question then becomes, why don't we just do more deep pleasure? Why, why not go to that end of the spectrum if it's so wonderful, it lasts long, and it's this wonderful, absolutely great thing? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Well, of course, obviously, you know, instant gratification is a wonderful thing. And it's often very much acceptable behavior in our society to indulge in all of these things. Freud talked about what he called the pleasure principle. You've probably heard that before. It was coined by Freud. And he says, it's the instinctual seeking of pleasure and avoiding of pain, that's key, in order to satisfy biological and psychological needs. The instinctual seeking of pleasure and avoiding of pain in order to satisfy biological and psychological needs. In other words, your id's in control. Well, I've been really wondering about this. Well, okay, so there's this pleasure thing, but why, why don't we? This is something I think that actually spiritual gurus have been trying to teach us for time and memorial. Why do we hurt ourselves? Why do we hurt the world? Why do we do these things? And I think it's because there are two other things that are involved with deep pleasure. One is, is that it asks you to take a risk or it asks you to expend energy, right? Vulnerability is a very difficult, risky thing. But sometimes it will ask that of you. It might ask you to see the world different. So in that case, it may ask you to change. These are things that that avoidance of pain that Freud was talking about, that's where this comes in. Now, I don't like parking lots. I like parks. But maybe I need to stop driving my car everywhere so they don't keep paving paradise and putting up that parking lot. That's an example of it asking you to change. There was a really interesting experiment that was done. I can't remember when it was done originally. It was a number of years. I'm thinking like the 1960s or something like that. Basically, they took a rat 
And uh, they put a little electrode to its brain where the little pleasure center was. And every time it hit a button, it got a little jolt of pleasure, like, ooh, happy, happy, happy <coughs> rat. And it had some food and some water in its cage. And eventually, as the scientists you know, watched it you know, over a long period of time, it hit that button more and more and more until finally it stopped even eating and drinking and it killed itself just to get that pleasure hit. That sounds pretty dire, right? But what's really interesting is that about something that was like five years ago, they redid that experiment. But rather than waiting for the rat to die after it got addicted to the pleasure, it took it, still having with the button, and put it with a bunch of other rats in a wonderful big cage with lots of things to do and lots of interaction, and the rats stopped using the button. Now, isn't that interesting? What is it that makes us want to then go and do those things, those connections that we have? You know, today, actually, after this service, you all have an opportunity to practice deep pleasure got two opportunities. <laughs> if you all remember, we have a town hall meeting afterwards because our pledge drive that we had this year actually was an increase over last year. And part of the commitment was that we would give 10% of that increase so that we would decide then how, what we wanted to do with it. So you should be very proud of yourselves that we did that. And that's part of the pleasure. We get to decide how do we want to give that money away? How do we want to do, what do we want to do with that to help the world? That's a wonderful place to be. That should be a pleasurable thing. You should feel good about it. It's not momentary, right? It will help people hopefully for a long time. We don't resent it. We don't crave it. It doesn't hurt anyone. It's not all about me. It does involve a little bit of risk though and some energy. You've got to show up at the town hall meeting. The risk was that some of you who added a little bit more to your pledge this year, we actually did more with less pledges this year. That's very cool. And of course you have to sit in a room with a bunch of people with a bunch of other ideas and listen to those other ideas too. The second opportunity you have to go into more of a deeper type of, uh, of pleasure is that Ted Lund Home is uh, cooking for the homeless in our kitchen right behind here. It doesn't take long. I don't know if he's doing burritos or sandwiches this time. Last time it just more hands, make it very, very quick. But then he goes out and he gives these to the homeless. He often goes to Santa Ana, whereas you know there's a ton of homeless around there that have no place else to go. It takes some energy. You might want to indulge in some coffee first. I totally get it. But come and cook and be part of this town hall meeting. And then if you're really feeling adventurous, you can go with Ted and meet the homeless, because that's a risk in seeing the world differently. So now this kind of, we've been talking mostly about individuals. What do we individually feel on this whole spectrum? But what happens when a society indulges in too much sort of the shallow pleasure side of things, or the pleasure without conscience? Because Gandhi and his grandson, they're just not concerned with about us individuals, but really about society as a whole. Well, we do things like we pave paradise and put up a parking lot. Everything becomes individualistic, right? It's all about me. This leads to sort of lower reasoning. It's all about what you want, that I don't have to care about what you want over there. It's all about what I want, right? I remember recently I just heard someone talking about their life in the upcoming elections, and they were saying, well, my life isn't any better in the last eight years. So I don't know how if I want to vote, you know, which way I want to vote. And I thought to myself, you know, unemployment went from 8.5 to 4.9%. That's one of the lowest ever. Not all about me. You know, it's, it's about the whole nation. And if it's all about me, then you often are going to have violence because it's, oh, if I want what I want, you want, you, you want what we're going to start fighting over it. Then you can start getting sometimes the rise of fascism and authoritarianism. That's all about what a few want, rather than what's best for everyone. As Unitarian Universalists, we don't talk much about physical pleasures. We tend to live in our head. But our seven principles, they tend to be somewhat a little bit intellectual. If you want to know our seven principles, they're on the back of the announcements that you were given when you first came in here. 
But look at our seventh principle. Our seventh principle is to affirm and promote respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we are a part. Respect for the interdependent web of existence for which we are a part. Now, if you remember what Covey said about that, he said independence is not the most mature state of being. It's, on the, it's a middle position on the way to interdependence, the most advanced and mature state. To learn to give and take, to live selflessly, to be sensitive, to be considerate is our challenge. Otherwise, there is no sense of social responsibility or accountability in our pleasurable activities. So here's how it sometimes goes, right, with pleasure. So I'm having a bad day and I go home and I indulge in a pleasure. I watch TV, I eat something sweet. I also indulge by not doing the things that build interdependence. Maybe I don't talk to my kids or I, hug, I don't hug my spouse. I don't call my mom back. As I go to sleep, I still feel kind of a little bad because I knew there were some things I should do. That nagging guilt that's always there, that I didn't do the things I know I, I sort of should do. But I want to be nice to myself. So maybe I indulge a little bit more. My spouse now is mad at me, so now I get myself a drink and it becomes this vicious cycle. I want to avoid the pain, so I get more pleasure, which causes more pain, that I want more pleasure. And the only way off of this cycle is to start taking responsibility to edge toward the deep end of pleasure. That sense of accomplishment and deepening of relationships by doing those things that you know that will help make the world better, if not just for yourself, but the world as a whole. I experienced this when I was in Seattle. As some of you know I'm a little estranged from my mother. I love my mother, but I'm not all that fond of her. She's a difficult person for me to be around, but I knew I needed to go see her. My twin sister also feels the same way. We procrastinated for about a week before we went to go do it. But I finally got up one morning, I'm like, this is taking too much energy to procrastinate. We need to go do this. So we did, we went to go see her, and of course it was actually a rather lovely visit, it was totally fine. I think we, we make it always a bit worse than it actually is. But that, and then I was able to sort of relax the rest of the vacation, right? I don't have to worry about it. I went to see my mother, checked on her, make sure she had what she needed. So you, know, you can ask yourself questions. How does, if you're wondering like, is this good or bad for me? Where am I on the spectrum? And you can decide for yourself what's a, what's, where's, where's the line for you? But you might ask yourself, how does it further my interdependence? Does it build relationships? So for example, Pokemon, this Pokemon Go thing, right? Well, actually, my sister is spending a lot of time with her son. And I found another, I was walking in the park, and I saw another mother and son walking together, doing it together. It can actually build some relationships, but all things in moderation, right? <laughs> You can ask yourself, am I harming anyone, including myself? And how am I long am I going to do this for? <clears throat> you know, there was a Buddhist monk who was talking to a bunch of Westerners about happiness. And he said this, he said, the difference between East and West is that in the West, you equate pleasure and happiness. He said, in the East, we think of happiness as the absence of pleasure and both are incorrect. Happiness is not something you pursue, right? Which is what we do when we overindulge in pleasures. Happiness is a byproduct of doing the right thing. So if I look at this pleasure continuum, most of the time we're somewhere in the middle, right? around all of these things and our behaviors and our indulgences. Sometimes they might lean more one to the other. But Unitarian Universalism, we tend to bring us closer to that happiness and egalitarianism, that sense that all are equal and taking care of everyone. And that's why we do our best to be generous, to be kind, to be compassionate. We try not to overindulge. Because what is the consequences if we do otherwise? Do we head toward the other end where it's all about the individual addictions and fascism. So if you want happiness, one, stop procrastinating. <laughs> and by all means, tell me that too, because I do it all the time. Don't overindulge. Build relationships. And take emotional and spiritual risks. 
That sounds pretty simple in some ways that it is. To me, if you have to boil it down, pleasure without conscience is the absence of love. Spiritual pleasure is the presence of love. If we could just live that way, I truly believe that things are going to be all right. May it be so, blessed be, and amen.